The deuterostomes are some of the most morphologically complex of all the animals, and they include a monophyletic group and are all very similar in how their embryos develop. And they include four phyla. Starfish and sea urchins make up the echinodermata, and all the vertebrates that you know and love make up the chordata. The two other phyla are less known, and they're both worm-like. One group is known as the acorn worms and form the phylum hemichordata. The xenoturbolita includes a worm-like organisms that have really only been discovered recently. The first group of organisms that we're going to talk about are the echinodermatas. So you might be thinking, wait, starfish are radially symmetrical. Shouldn't they be more closely related to the other radially symmetrical groups, the cnidarians and the stenophorans? I knew you were wondering that. Well, they're not. They're actually in the bilateral group of organisms. But you really only see it when they are larvae. Their larvae are bilateral. But as they develop, they become radially symmetrical. They are truly very strange. Starfish and echinoderms both have an endoskeleton. This is a hard structure just under the skin of the animal, and it's made from calcium carbonate, the same stuff that's in shells. And it's a structure that provides protection and support. Echinoderms also have another very unique morphological feature known as a water vascular system. And it's a series of branching fluid-filled tubes. These tubes fill with water and form a hydrostatic skeleton very similar to what worms do. The water vascular system is also involved in movement. In starfish, the vascular system runs along the arms of the starfish, and biologists call the arms tube feet. And the vascular system attaches to specialized structures that end outside of the tube feet. These are called podia, and that literally translates to feet. As the podia extend and contract in a coordinated fashion, they alternatively grab and release a substrate, which allows them to move in a specific direction. Podia are not only essential for moving, they're also how members of the Echinodermata capture their food. Some members of the Echinodermata are very efficient predators in tidal zones of oceans and brackish waters. They use their podia to pry open bivalves such as clams. They then extrude their stomach through an opening in the middle of their body and digest the clam in its shell. Ugh, starfish aren't so cute now, are they? Other members of the Echinodermata use podia to capture food particles in the current, and little hairs called cilia sweep the food into the mouth of the organism. This is known as suspension feeding. Echinodermata have five main lineages. We're going to talk about each one of these separately. Crinoidea includes the feather stars and sea lilies. These are sessile suspension feeders, and they're really pretty. And next we'll talk about the asteroidae, or the sea stars. Sea stars, I always call them starfish, but anyway, they make up a lineage called asteroidae. And they have bodies with five or more arms, and some species can have up to 40. And unlike the brittle stars, the sea stars' arms are not set off by clear joint-like articulations. Rather, they're kind of fleshy arms that move around. And sea stars are predatory. In fact, they're like the lions of the tide pool, and they move by organizing the movement of their tube feet and podia. And if they weren't strange enough already, this will probably blow your cap. They have sex with their arms. No, really. They have sex with their arms. Strange. Very strange indeed. Next, we'll talk about the brittle stars. Brittle stars and basket stars make up the lineage Ophoroidea, and they have five or more arms that radiate out from a central disc. But they use these arms to suspension feed, and they capture food particles and move them towards their mouth via cilia. Next on our list is the sea urchins and the sand dollars. Sea urchins and sand dollars make up the lineage Echinoidae. Compared to the rest of the group, the echinoids are the only ones that have spherical bodies. Sea urchins are spiny echinoids that crawl using their spines, and they constantly graze on algae and kelp. So if the sea stars are the lions of the tide pool, the echinoids are the gazelles. Whereas sand dollars have disc-shaped bodies and are suspension feeders. And the last group of the echinodermata are the sea cucumbers. Perhaps the strangest group of the echinodermata are the sea cucumbers. And they make up the group Holothuroidea. 
There are sausage-shaped animals that suspension or deposit feed with the aid of modified tube feet arranged in a whorl around their mouth. We're going to skip across the two rarely found groups and move straight to the chordates. However, I recommend looking into them because they're really truly strange organisms. Vertebrate animals are chordates, but not all chordates are vertebrates. All members of the chordates that aren't vertebrates have a hollow nerve cord that runs the length of their body. This is like a nerve superhighway that connects the different parts of the body. And they also have a notochord, which is a supportive yet flexible rod. In vertebrates, this notochord has developed to become the vertebral column, also known as the backbone. And at some point in their development, all members of chordata have openings in their throats called pharyngeal gill slits. These allow organisms to breathe in an aquatic environment. Members of the chordata also have a tail at least some point in their lives. You might be thinking, wait, humans are chordates and we don't have gill slits or tails. And you're right. However, in the early development of the fetus, humans do in fact have both of these structures. And here's an overview of all the chordates we'll be talking about today. And we're going to start with the most primitive, the cephalochordates. The cephalochordata are better known as lancets, and they resemble fish, but they're not. And they're small suspension feeders that can move around. And yet, they're an important link between invertebrate and vertebrate organisms. Their notochord is flexible, yet supportive rod, and is the first known evolutionary endoskeleton. Next on our list are the sea squirts, also known as the tunicates. The sea squirts are in the Eurochordata. This is a marine group of organisms that all have a U-shaped gut with two siphons that they use in the process of suspension feeding. One opening brings water and food particles in, and the other expels water and waste. They're also unique among the chordates because they have an exoskeleton coat called a tunic. This group of organisms do not have a vertebral column, so they're not considered vertebrates, but they are a part of the chordata. All the other animal groups I'll talk about in this lecture are the vertebrates, and they all have a vertebral column. What makes a vertebrate a vertebrate is that their nerve cord develops into a spinal cord. And another thing that they all have in common is that vertebrates have gill slits earlier in their development. You can see these slits in organisms as different as fish, reptiles, and even humans. In aquatic species, the pharyngeal gill slits become actual gills. While all vertebrates have a spinal cord and pharyngeal gill slits, at least some part in their life, there have been several innovations that have occurred in the evolution of vertebrates. One of the first was the development of a bony exoskeleton. And this was the first appearance of scale-like patterns in aquatic animals, and was a predecessor of fish and reptile scales we see today. But some of the first ones were really thick and made out of bone. But those organisms don't exist on Earth today. Jaws also developed in the vertebrates. This represented a new method of feeding in which a mouth is connected to a hinge that allows it to open and close very precisely. This proved so effective that nearly all vertebrates to this day have jaws. Contrary to what you might think, not all vertebrates have a bony endoskeleton. This innovation came during the Silurian and gave fish with a bony endoskeleton a major advantage in the water due to their ability to swim much more quickly and precisely. It's kind of like comparing the speed and handling of a 1950s station wagon in a modern Formula One car. And perhaps one of the craziest evolutionary adaptations that ever occurred was when fish fins evolutionarily developed into limbs that could be used for crawling. The first known animals that crawled onto land were known as tetrapods, literally translating to four legs. And there's still an animal on Earth today that resembles what the earliest fish to come out of water must have looked like. It's called a lungfish, and it has really strong fins and lungs, so it has the ability to live in pools that dry up. The advantage of this is that the lungfish can move over land from pool to pool without suffocating. Once on land, another adaptation evolved that greatly improved the chance of an organism's offspring of surviving, and they are known as amniotic eggs. Amniotic eggs have membranes that have a yolk inside of them in order to nourish and protect the embryo. In reptiles and birds, they lay them on land and allow them to develop. 
Mammals retain their amniotic eggs within their bodies in a specialized organ that contains a placenta which gives oxygen and nutrients directly from the mother to the embryo. And mammals give birth to live young. Let's get back to our phylogenetic journey, deuterostomes. The most primitive vertebrates are the hagfish and the lampreys. Both of these organisms lack jaws, but they do have a nerve cord that isn't hollow. This is really what differentiates them from the cephalochords. Hagfish completely lack a vertebral column, whereas the lamprey actually has pieces of cartilage along the nerve cord. And they also differ by how they eat. Hagfish are scavengers and predators of small prey, where lampreys attach themselves to larger fish like whales and shark and feed off them as they move. Next on our list are the cartilaginous fish, the sharks, rays, and skates. All of these organisms have a skeleton made out of cartilage, not bone. And if you compare them with the hagfish and the lampreys, the cartilaginous fish also have jaws and paired fins for more streamlined swimming. Next on our list are the bony fish. The bony fish are also known as the ray fin fish, and compared with the cartilaginous fish like the sharks and rays, they all have fins supported by long bony rods and they have a bony skeleton. They also have an organ that can fill with air in order to regulate their depths with minimal energy, and this is known as a swim bladder. This group is arguably the most successful group of vertebrates, if you consider the number of species that they make up. Next on our list are the lobe-finned fish. Lobe-finned fish differ from ray-finned fish in that their bottom fins are not pointed, or they're not ray-shaped. They are lobe-shaped, or you can think of them as not pointed. Evolutionarily, these are really important organisms because they are thought to be the link between fish and the first animals to walk on land, the tetrapods. There are two groups of lobe-finned fish on Earth today. The lungfish are present in shallow ponds, and the coelacanth lives in the ocean. Coelacanths were actually thought to have gone extinct in the late Cretaceous, but they were rediscovered in 1938 off the coast of South Africa. And the coelacanth has been nicknamed a living fossil because it was originally known only through fossils long before the discovery of a live specimen. All the remaining groups of animals we'll discuss today are the four-legged animals, collectively known as the tetrapods, and we'll start with the amphibians. Amphibians include frogs, toads, and salamanders. And even though they have mouths, they actually breathe through their skin. All of them do. And they're all carnivores mostly eating small animals, especially insects, and they all lay eggs in water and have four limbs. The one weird exception is the Saclians. They look like worms but are actually amphibians and have evolutionarily lost their eyes and limbs. Really weird, huh? All the other vertebrates give birth in an amniotic egg, and we'll begin with the mammals. All mammals have three things in common which differentiates them from other vertebrates. First, they all have hair. They also feed their young by mammary glands. And they're endothermic, meaning that they produce their own body heat. Reptiles are exothermic, and they rely on the environment for heat. There are three main groups of mammals, the monotremes, the marsupials, and the eutherians. And we'll start with the monotremes. Monotremes are a very rare group of mammals. In fact, only three species exist on Earth. The platypus is one of them. In fact, the platypus was so strange that the first explorers to write about them were discounted because no one believed that such a strange animal existed. And the monotremes can be differentiated from the other mammals because they lay eggs and they have leathery bills. Marsupials are the next group on our tour. Marsupials are a group of mammals that basically give birth to a fetus, which then attaches to its mother's nipple for most of its development. Marsupials are very common in Australia. However, there's one species native to the Americas, the possum. The mammals we most think about are the eutherians. Eutherians include many animals from whales to rabbits and even humans. And these animals are differentiated from marsupials and monotremes and that they have a highly developed placenta and give birth to highly developed young. 
Many animals in this group also have a long brooding period with their young. And the combination of these factors have produced some of the most intelligent creatures on our planet. Lizards, turtles, crocodiles, and birds all form the group Reptilia, and they all have scales with hard keratin. And they also have lungs, give birth in amniotic eggs, and are ectothermic, meaning that they are dependent on their environment for heat. The one exception is birds. They are endothermic. The oldest group of extant reptiles is the lizards and snakes. Lizards and snakes make up a group known as the Lepidosauria, and they all have elongated bodies and scaly skin. Lizards have jointed legs, whereas snakes are limbless. Some species of snake actually have vestigial limbs, which they use to hold on to their mates during intercourse. The picture shows one of these called a spur. Next on our list are the turtles. Turtles and tortoises are a group of reptiles that have a shell of bony plates for protection, and they all lack teeth and have a bony beak. Turtles are predominantly aquatic, whereas tortoises are predominantly terrestrial. Next on our list are the crocodiles and alligators. Crikey! Crocodiles and alligators can be differentiated from other groups of reptiles by having eyes and nostrils on the top part of their heads. And this is an important adaptation for ambushing prey on the shoreline. And the very last group on our tour of the animal kingdom are the birds. Believe it or not, birds are reptiles, and the reptiles that have feathers, lightweight bones, and are endothermic. And this concludes our tour of the animal kingdom. I hope you enjoyed it.